Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this inaugural, inaugural webinar uh, of our series, Seeing the Forest. My name is Lori Weyburn, and I'm the president and co-founder of the Pacific Forest Trust. In this very first of our webinars, where we're gonna be exploring how the essential benefits and services of forests, be they for clean water, clear air, a more livable climate, all of our wonderful wildlife or timber products or carbon flow from forests when we manage forests as a whole and for the whole, not for any single one of those alone. So we're bringing you today's webinar from Glasgow, Scotland, where two of us who are on the panel are uh, attending the 26th Conference of the Parties on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And that is Andrea Tuttle and myself. And our two other panelists are in the States, Ann Bartuska in Washington, DC, and Jerry Franklin in Oregon. Just a word about the structure of this webinar. Each of our panelists will be speaking for roughly seven minutes and then we'll have a conversation between them and then we'll have time for question and answers. Those questions and answers are going, to, the questions are gonna be posed in the chat but that will only go uh, into our host and they will be collected and asked at the end. So that is, we'll get to as many as we can in that time. I'll be introducing our panelists further as each of them speaks, but I just wanna set the context here. We are focusing today on the climate services, not the carbon benefits of forests. And this is because as we know, the second largest source of carbon emissions is from forest loss and degradation. And it's been recognized even since 1992 with the first international convening in Kyoto, Japan, that forests were essential to solving the climate crisis or making the climate crisis worse. And in fact, they were recognized as so essential that the very first operative article of the Kyoto Protocol, after the first one, which says, whereas all the nations of the world agree that the climate crisis must be solved, was all the nations of the world agree to conserve and steward and protect their forests. Well, we've kind of seen how that's played out since 1992, but that focus on the importance of the conservation and restoration of forests has been essential ever since then. It's been controversial as well, because what happened in Kyoto was it was agreed that we needed market mechanisms to address the question of forests, and there was real question and concern over the ensuing years about the quality of projects that were done under those market mechanisms, something called the clean development mechanism. And then in the subsequent agreements under the conference of the parties under the red agreements, the questions were, were these meaningful or were they greenwashed? How were we really addressing those questions? And then we had the landmark agreement in 2015 at the Paris COP, where there was the so-called Paris Agreement signed, where nations identified what they were going to do. They were gonna make nationally determined contributions to keeping our temperature rise below 1.5 degrees centigrade. And in that, it was recognized that the role of forests was going to be critical but again, it was going to be addressed through voluntary market mechanisms. Here we are, five years later, nations have been reporting on their progress or lack of progress towards those nationally determined commitments. And we have all come to realize that even though those are really good, they're not nearly enough. The other thing that we've realized is that we have to step up implementation of the existing commitments and move those up. Critical to doing that will be how we engage the power of forests. Another thing has changed since 1992, even though there was extinction happening at that time, today we stand at risk of losing a million species. And there's a really essential linkage 
between the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. And as we speak today about forests, the role of forests is essential to helping both heal the climate and save the world's biodiversity. The questions remain as to how we do that and who does that and how is that done and accounted for. So those are essential controversies you've seen in the media. There's still major, major concern about is this greenwashing or is this meaningful? So to help us tease this apart, both what we do with forests and what's most meaningful with forests, and then if we know what's most meaningful with forests, why aren't we doing it? Andrea Tuttle is going to discuss the role of market mechanisms and offsets and standards and governments. Jerry Franklin is going to help us understand what different things that you do with forests really matter. Is tree planting the answer? Is saving old growth the answer? What about all the space in between when you plant a tree and to when it's old growth? Where should we be acting and when will that benefit us? And then Ann Bartuska will be addressing the questions of, well, gosh, if we know what to do and we know how to do it, why aren't we doing it? Here we are in this host country, Scotland, and there's that wonderful phrase, well, let's just be getting on with it. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Andrea Tuttle. Andrea Tuttle, I'm thrilled to say, is a Pacific Trust, Pacific Forest Trust board member. Um, and she is a consultant in forests and climate policy. She was director of California's Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. And she helped launch California's climate policy and especially the role that forests play within it, being engaged in the first forest carbon protocols and then taking that experience internationally, this is her 12th COP, I believe. Her first one was in Bali when they began talking about protocols on tropical deforestation. And she's carried all the way through here on into Glasgow. So with that introduction, Andrea, would you kick us off? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Lori. It's really great to have you joining us. Can you? We'll have to do those. I've already Not done it. Right. Sorry, mute question. Hello? No. Now, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, everybody. It's great to have you joining us. And greetings from the teeming activities here in Glasgow at COP26. Let me start by setting the scene internationally. I've been here for a week and a half, and I've sampled almost all the types of events that are here on offer. I've been in some of the negotiations, many of the high level speeches, the pavilions, the side events, the street theater. There's politicians and indigenous representatives from almost every continent. It's a hundred ring circus. And it's also a thrill to be surrounded by languages and people from all over the world. It reminds us how diverse the world is. I have two big impressions from this COP that differ from the others that I've attended. First, there's definitely a shift in mood and tone, talking about action and not just blah, blah, blah. The tech crowd is here. The banks and financial institutions are here. This is new. The corporate world is here in <laughs> great strength. The negotiation sessions are deep in the technical details of options to finalize the Paris rulebook, and the urgency is about action. My second impression is that the words nature-based solutions are heard throughout. They're spoken by unexpected voices, the economists, the climate modelers, the many countries and sectors, not just the nature groups. This is new and certainly forests are central to the substance of nature-based solutions. The biggest issues at this COP as a whole, this is just a high level interview to set the context. The primary call is that countries need to increase their pledges to reduce their emissions. The 1.5 degree target is slipping out of reach. Countries need to get off coal, convert to electric vehicles, invest in renewables and stop deforestation. Also at the forefront, we're getting serious about finance. 
Always an overarching issue at the UN is the gap between the developed and the developing countries. And the developing countries are now speaking even more forcefully for equity and funding so that they can develop with a low carbon future instead of their traditional coal-based path. Back in 2009, the world pledged to provide $100 billion a year from public and private sources. But very little of that has materialized and the developing world is mad. They did not cause the climate crisis, but they are the most vulnerable and they are suffering the worst impacts. So almost every decision and negotiation point here comes back to finance. Both developing and middle income economies are saying, we will not vote for consensus in the negotiations, whether for increased ambition or reporting or hot air or forests or stranded fossil fuel assets, whatever, until the finance question is uh, resolved and we get help. So this is really a dominant issue behind the scenes. What claims are valid? Who should contribute? How much and from what source? So where I'm spending most of my attention is tracking agreement on what's called Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which deals with pricing carbon and establishing a market, which brings us directly to forests and the topic of offsets. As you know, offsets are one tool to incentivize and pay landowners for protecting and increasing carbon storage on their lands. But let me take a short tangent and state my personal opinion. I believe that, legis that legitimate and compliance offsets with integrity and honest accounting are available and attainable. In spite of the fringe criticism that you hear in the media that goes viral, the California standards are still the most rigorous and honest to the atmosphere of any forest standard anywhere. But at the same time, I also think that offsets should play a partial role in realizing the overall carbon potential from forest. There's still a big role for entities to adopt policies and fund programs to protect existing carbon stocks in forests and to restore depleted carbon stocks. And future webinars will uh, discuss this in more detail. So for now, let me quickly summarize the issues in Article 6. Uh, there's two types of markets that it addresses. One is for projects in tropical countries between a project developer and a specific buyer, uh, such as these corporate net zero pledges that you're hearing so much about now. And the second is for country to country trades of emission reduction credits. If a country has more re emission reductions than it needs to meet its pledge, it could trade its surplus to another country that needs them. So you can quickly see all the questions and challenges that arise with this. What are the standards for measuring emission reductions and additionality and permanence? What are the safeguards for indigenous forest communities? How do we ensure the books aren't cooked and both parties don't claim the same uh, gains? That's the double counting issue. Who keeps the books? How transparent are the transactions? What should the fee be on each transaction? This is the share of proceeds discussion. And then there's the hot air question. What do we do with 4 billion tons of low quality credits that were issued under the Kyoto mechanism uh, that countries who own them want to have grandfathered in. And if we do, that'll swamp the system. So that's still a big issue. I'm gonna close now with some comments on the, on the uh, declaration on deforestation that you heard about last week, the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forests and Land Use. This was an agreement signed last week by the presidents and prime ministers of 100 countries while they were here. It commits to uh, halting and reversing forest loss and degradation by 2030, and it pledges around $30 billion from various countries and programs. So this is great. Um, it's, it was uh, greeted with enthusiasm. If tropical deforestation were a country, 
it would be the third largest emitter of carbon dioxide. So it would be terrific if stopping deforestation were possible, but this is a heavy lift and we need a word of caution. We have been trying to do this for many, many decades. Um, we've had similar declarations in the past, but there is a reason why deforestation in tropical countries continues. Forests are the main, if not the only source of funding for their economy. Indonesia, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and many other tropical countries, maybe even the Congo, have refused to sign that pledge or they're backing off their pledge. They say, how can you expect us to close down our primary livelihood and not let our country develop and help our people? So this brings us back to finance and helping countries to develop without destroying their forests. Just uh, in closing, let me quote from a respected scientist from C4 uh, last week at the Global Landscape for, uh, Forum. This is Ravi Prabhu from C4. He said, forests are not just an add-on to climate policy. They are equally, if not more crucial than any other sector. The declaration to stop deforestation is a step but we cannot yet fly the banner of mission accomplished. It offers an opportunity to transition from projects to progress and progress to paradigm shift. So with that, I'm gonna sign off and look forward to discussion later, thanks. Um, thank you, Andrea. That's terrific. And for those of you who track these things, um, forests went from Article 2 in the Kyoto Protocol, and they are now at number 39 within the draft declaration to come from Glasgow, but they're followed almost immediately by number 44 about welcoming all forms of capital, especially private capital in, to help nations meet their nationally determined commitments. So as Andrea says, there's a lot there to be worked through. Our next panelist is Jerry Franklin. And Jerry Franklin, many of you know, as I do, very simply as the Obi-Wan Kenobi of forests. However, from his technical biography point of view, he was the chief plant ecologist for the research branch of the Forest Service of the United States for 35 years. And then the next 32 years, the professor of forest ecosystems at the University of Washington School of Environmental and Forest Science. He retired to emeritus status in 2019. And amongst his 500 publications is a recently published textbook, Ecological Forest Management. And if all of you look very closely at the background in Ann Bartuska's screen, you might see that. <laughs> so Jerry, there's a tremendous amount of talk here about tree planting and saving old virgin forests. What else can be done with forests to help meet the climate crisis? Well, there's a lot that can be done. Uh, certainly, you know, tree planting and, and reservation of existing old forests are certainly uh, contributing elements, but uh, clearly forests have an immense potential uh, in terms of sequestering globe, uh, atmospheric carbon, and that's one of the very great values that they have for us. And uh, from the standpoint of the United States, obviously it could make a, uh, using the forest could uh, go a long ways towards meeting our national commitment uh, to these programs. But it's gonna have to be a very different kind of forestry uh, than it has been in the past. Uh, basically, uh, plantations grown on short rotations make essentially no significant contribution to uh, the carbon balance at all. And in fact, if anything, they're probably a negative rather than a positive. And so uh, we're going to have to be doing something other than that uh, 
particularly on the most productive forest lands we've got, which are the historic industrial forest lands. So plant root, plants, plantations grown on short rotations and are not what we are talking about at all. You know, we need forest management that uh, basically results in increases in the mean carbon stock level per acre out there on these large forested landscapes. So we need to, to move these landscapes uh, here in the United States back towards the levels of average levels of carbon stock that they had historically. And of course today, particularly in places like the Douglas fir region of Northwestern North America, they're dramatically drawn down. They're a, a, a tiny fraction, a few percentage uh, of the amount of carbon that was historically uh, stored there on a per acre basis. So how do you do this sort of thing? How do you manage a forest in a way that will uh, result in significant uh, long-term contribution to carbon sequestration. And on all of this, as Laurie pointed out, what we want to be sure that we do is that we manage these forests not exclusively for carbon storage, but in fact, what we want to do is manage these forests for the multiplicity of important functions that they carry out for us. And at the same time, what we want to make sure they do is also make a much greater contribution than managed force today do to this uh, aspect of carbon storage. And fortunately, uh, there's a few strategies that work not only for carbon storage, but also uh, increase the value of the forest from the standpoint of water, water yields, water quality, wildlife habitat. Uh, we do not want to get into the mindset that we want to try to max out carbon stored everywhere, uh, regardless of cost to other aspects of the system. We did that with timber production. We don't want to do it with carbon sequestration as well. So what kind of forestry uh, would result in uh, these kinds of things. And there's basically, it has to do with managing the forest for a multiplicity of objectives rather than singular objectives. One of the, ex one of the attributes of that kind of forestry is going to be longer rotations. Uh, rather than the very short rotations that we often see on the capital-driven industrial forest lands, uh, we need to be growing forests uh, on the kind of rotations that capture uh, their, their long-term productive capacity. That's really very important. And for example, that might mean uh, in uh, uh, a, a region in the Western United States, for example, growing forests on uh, rotations of 80 to 120 years, uh, rather than uh, 30 to 40 years, which is what they're managed on now. And by doing that, you realize the full potential uh, that these coniferous forests have in, in terms of storing carbon. So longer rotations. Um, and uh, a second thing is that uh, we don't ever clear cut these forests anymore. We always retain um, a significant amount of structure in the forest. So when we harvest them, instead of using something like clear cutting, uh, we retain significant elements of the preceding forest, the forest that we're harvesting to become part of the next generation of forest. Or we do a partial cutting or selective cutting kind of harvest. So basically we're never drawing down the carbon stocks to the very low levels that we did when we were clear cutting. The third thing that we have to think about is the species that we're dealing with. And of course, uh, because we're interested in resistance and resilience as well as 
as carbon stocks. Um, we want to be thinking about using a diversity of species rather than monocultures, which tend to be very uh, susceptible uh, to catastrophes of various kinds. And, uh, but it's very interesting that different species have very different capabilities in terms of long-term carbon storage. And uh, there, there's a whole array of species that grow very fast, uh, but don't live very long and don't have very decay resistant wood. Uh, there's a, another whole set of species that tend to be much longer lived and produce a great amount of heartwood. And that makes a big difference because if you have trees that are grown that have a lot of heartwood, basically when they die or even when they're turned into forest products, uh, they're going to have a longer lifespan uh, than uh, wood of species that have very low levels of decay resistance. So we want to think about the species that we are dealing with uh, in managing these longer rotations. Uh, we want to have species that grow well but also produce uh, a denser and a more decay resistant wood. Obviously, uh, plantations uh, are very helpful, but if all we are doing is creating plantations that are monocultures and are, are harvested by clear cutting on a very short rotation, this is inconsequential as far as the world's carbon stocks are concerned. It has no meaning whatsoever. I would argue. Um, and obviously also, uh, it means that where we have forests that have currently a very large stock of carbon, probably like the mature forests and the old forests in our Douglas fir region, we should be leaving those, trying to protect them and retain them for as long as we can. So, where we have forests with large stocks of carbon sequestered, probably want to protect those and retain those uh, rather than uh, harvesting them. So those are some of the ways, longer rotations, careful selection of species, using harvest systems that don't result in barren forest lands are all ways of raising that mean level of carbon stored in our forest landscapes. That's it. Pretty Thank you simple. so much, Jerry. Uh, one of the things that we're hearing both from you and from Andrea is that we are seeing the need for a paradigm shift and it's across all forests, which is a point that Andrea was making that others here also have made is the forest sector is not an afterthought on the side. It's got to be central and we need transformation, that paradigm shift. Well, to help us think about that and how we get to that paradigm shift, we have Dr. Ann Bartuska, and I'm thrilled that she is also a member of the Board of Pacific Forest Trust. In fact, she's our chair. And she is former deputy undersecretary and chief scientist from the US Department of Agriculture. She's currently a senior advisor at Resources for the Future and a senior contributing scientist at the Environmental Defense Fund. And so Anne, help us understand if we know what we need to do and we know where we need to go, why aren't we doing that? Um, thanks, Laurie. That's a, a tee up for a really challenging question. <laughs> Um, and actually, first, I want to apologize. I'm on the flight path between the White House and Andrews Air Force Base, and there seems to be a lot of activity right now. So if you hear helicopters, folks, that's why. It's, it's the usual Washington, D.C. pattern. Um, yes, yeah, so let's, let's go back to what Jerry um, was leaving us with, which is the mental model of the forests of the United States and, and probably the forests of the world, where you have the old growth, the mature stands, really major carbon stocks and critical importance to um, habitat, water quality, as well as to climate resilience. But you also have the entire transition and, and suite of different kinds of forest structures that exist 
all the way to plantation forestry that has its own role. So if we look at that entire spectrum of forest types, you know, how do we how do we tease out what can be done in each of those categories to make the greatest difference? So I'm going to start with the public lands because I think that is a fairly unique um, characteristic of some countries and certainly the United States. We have about half of our forest landscape is in uh, federal lands. And because of that, um, we have some unique responsibilities for maintaining those for the conditions that they were established for, as well as thinking to the future. So right there, you have the challenge. Um, most public lands are managed by specific agencies that had a set of statutes that established them, in some cases over 100 years ago. And that's a, a battleship that takes a while to move, to go from the original establishment conditions to the new conditions. And so how you do that, um, it does take some time. I think it requires the science which we've been developing. And it also uh, requires changing plans to be responsive. My point in this is it's, it's not a nimble process. It's one that does happen evolutionarily um, over time. And I think the more that we can be identifying these outcomes that we're looking for, the kinds of processes that could be done with the science can identify the types of forest management practices that, that Dr. Feinkham was talking about, that helps that inform the, the new set of standards, the new sets of guidelines. So that's one part of the, the issue with our public estate. But the other, is, I think, challenge is who pays for it? Um, the, the fact that it is the taxpayer that actually contributes to the management of those lands means that they have to be appropriated at a level commensurate with the work that's needed. Um, historically, some of that work was done through the mechanism of a timber sale. And yet what we now know is that um, while timber sales are very appropriate in some areas, some of the work that needs to be done is removing hazardous fuels so that we reduce wildfire risk. It's doing thinnings to restore forest condition. It's establishing these longer rotation forests that we were just talking about. And that takes upfront capital to do that. And so to the extent that we can be moving the, um, the funding mechanism to improve and increase the access to that capital to do that work is critically important. And we're seeing some of that movement. And for those who follow um, US politics, the um, infrastructure bill has actually given us a big leg up on being able to do that kind of work. But then you also have the need to have, and this is also true for private land forests, um, the bodies to do the work and the workforce that is that's educated and trained to do that work. And that is, is sometimes a major hurdle because many of these forests are in rural areas, but you also need to have the infrastructure. And maybe that's our biggest challenge right now that over the last several decades, we've reduced the, um, the infrastructure to take as we do management of forests, take some of that wood out of the forest and turn it into a product rather than burning it on site or moving it into a landfill. And so to the extent that we can rebuild that industrial infrastructure in a way that allows the nimbleness we're looking for is, is a challenge. And I think there's a lot of interest in doing that. I think as we develop new technologies so that we have, um, facilities that could create products that are more mobile than, than we might have had in the past, that's that to be a chain will be a change as well as the new products. So you have all of those at play in the federal estate. And yet that is an area in at least the United States where you have so much um, public land where you can actually get real value and benefit through the longer rotations, through um, very targeted reforestation with the species that can actually respond to climate and be creating more cl climate resilient um, watersheds and, and landscapes. So let's move to the private lands part because that is the, the other half of our, our forest estate is dominated by uh, private landowners. Um, there's the industrial companies that are actively managing and using wood products. But we also have, and this is one of the challenges, approximately 9 million non-industrial private landowners based on the last National Woodland Owner Survey, and more than um, 
20, more than 20% of those do not have any management plans. So we have landowners who are sitting on what could be a productive forest, maybe is, we don't know. And they're not managing for anything in particular where they could have be thinking about how can they optimize the climate resiliency? How can they optimize habitat? How can they optimize um, water quality goals as well as carbon sequestration? So being able to address the, the needs of those 9 million private landowners, many of whom are very in underserved communities and very rural communities, that's one of the real challenges I think we have to, to think about uh, being able to influence and, and bring that community into the mix of how we address forestry. But you also want to have ensure that we have good private working forest lands that are contributing to wood products that will extend the amount of carbon in, in these wood products longer than um, the, the usual rotation. Because the value of that, if we have a healthy wood products market, then we have people investing in forest lands rather than converting it to other uses like urban, peri-urban areas, agriculture, et cetera. But we also then have a way for people to stay on the land and be, keep those forests as forests. So you have the whole mix of different, pro, uh, different activities that are needed. One of the um, opportunities I think within the Department of Agriculture is to make those investments and help provide incentives so that forest landowners can in fact meet those needs that we have and be able to um, stay on the land contributing to carbon sequestration and climate resiliency, as well as to be able to get a, a product from that. So it's, to me, it's not an either or, it's a continuum of all of these different of these efforts. The, the last thing I guess I want to address is, so how do we know? Um, I've talked about some of the barriers. I think there are some great opportunities to move the needle with some good investments. But then what's going on in the forest? Can we in fact track uh, that, track the carbon that we are either um, increasing, decreasing or holding level? And what is the approach to do that? What is the measuring and monitoring system that we have that can do that? We're, well, we're very fortunate in the United States that we have a forest inventory program that has been enabling us to track forests. But it, but it still needs to have the kind of granularity that would get us to carbon, as well as other uh, more details at a, a smaller, finer scale, both spatially and temporally. So can we build off this inventory system that we have? Can we augment it with satellite imagery and with other kinds of, of measuring systems? But we really need to make that investment commensurate with the active forest management in the measuring and monitoring system so that we know that we are accomplishing the goals and the outcomes that we've set for ourselves. And in a market-based system, if you don't measure it and monitor it, then you really can't value it in the same way that, that you could with, with that kind of rigor. So that is a, the, um, and maybe the third leg of the stool in all of this is being able to have a system that allows us to track Carmen to be evaluating our ecosystems, forest ecosystems and to know that in fact, we are achieving the climate resiliency and the mitigation goals that, we're, that we've been intending. So I will stop with that. I think we've covered a whole lot of territory for the, the next round of the, the Q&A part of the session. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, and a couple of things that you just highlighted there before we have the one last question posed to the panel is you again brought it back to this distinction between carbon and climate and having a market for carbon while wanting services for climate. And one of the things that both you and Jerry talked about was having older forests and managing them for more than plantations. So there's some interesting elements in there as we're stepping away from just a commodity of carbon and a market that focuses on that commodity to the bigger paradigm shift for climate. So I want to ask each one of you in turn, if you had a magic wand and you could do one thing to advance the role of forests in helping heal our climate, what would that one thing be? And I'd like to ask Andrea Tuttle to start and tell us what one thing she would do. And then we will go to Anne Bartuska and we will close with Jerry Franklin. 
So, Andrea? That's because I, I it's a dual, I'm sorry. Hi, um, boy, uh, one magic wand, that's a tough one. Um, you can think on all different levels. One of the ones that I find most frustrating though, is the difficulty in communicating the complexity of forests and forest management and what is needed um, uh, to the public. They are so, um, it's so easy to get a, a story that is skewed and doesn't really reflect the full story. Um, uh, Lori tells me that, well, yes, forests, are, forests and forest accounting is complicated, but so is the accounting for many other sectors. Um, electric vehicles, uh, aviation, uh, marine transport, everything, border adjustment taxes, all these other mechanisms we're talking about are complicated too. So um, it's not just forest, but really um, I wish that we could get a, a broader public understanding of the role, first of all, the role of forests in climate mitigation uh, and adaptation, and then the many dimensions that we need to consider when we're talking about um, how we adjust our management uh, practices and how we um, uh, um, care for the indigenous communities that live in forests throughout the tropics uh, and all these many dimensions. What are, what are the real standards? And now that we have uh, net zero pledges by so many corporations, are those credits that they're claiming from projects um, in the developing world really additional? Do, are they re do they really have integrity? Do they really have permanence? So all these aspects um, really need, I think, a broader public understanding. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so, so your magic wand would be a common language and common understanding, and that would help us move forward. Anne, what would your magic wand answer be? I'm trying to whittle it down to one. <laughs> <laughs> and there's many, there's many, but maybe riffing a little bit off of what Andrea just said, and it's, it's having the understanding of people, the importance of forests in their lives, goes beyond just climate. And if we were able to more deliberately manage our source watersheds, where we have greater than 50% are on federal lands, if we can improve in the health of those, those forest lands, coupling that with the basic provisions of water, of habitat, and of, of climate response, um, to me, that would get us so many gains in so many different areas. And right now, I think we manage factor one factor versus another, one forest type versus another. Maybe this is the ecosystem ecologist in me wanting to look at a landscape scale where we're, we're really carving up the, the multiple activities and working in a much more integrated way. So perhaps that's, that's the uh, more complex wand worthy of a wand waving. Um, but to me, that would really change the way we view how forests are in the, in the forestry sector. Well, that sounds like you are saying we should manage for the whole forest and not just for any one thing. I uh, think you got it. Jerry, if you had a magic wand. Well, it's gonna be very similar uh, uh, to what Anne had to say. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you go back 60 years, 70 years, uh, the view that we had of forests, uh, particularly the forester, the forest manager had, was this is a collection of trees. And uh, the most important thing we can do is manage it efficiently for the production of wood. And uh, what's happened in the last uh, more than a half century now, we've really learned a great deal about how forests are fundamentally structured. 
uh, what and we've learned that they are comp they are ecosystems that consists of many organisms uh, that are linked together and um, and that carry out many important functions. And as you know, I often say all for us are working for us because all of them are doing some important things for us. So what I would what I would do if I could is insist that our approach to all four systems be on the basis that these are of understanding that they are comprehensive, uh, complete ecosystems and managing them accordingly with respect for all of the values that they provide and with respect for the complexity uh, that they that exists. So applying what we now know about forest ecosystems and the management of the forest estate. Well, that would do enormous things for the whole of forests, but also for the absorption of carbon. When we look at the United States forests on private lands, as you were mentioning, we're a tiny fraction at most say 10%, you know, at the bottom end, 10%, and at the upper end on the public lands, maybe 50% of the carbon that they can hold. So if we restored those forests to the whole forest, we'd make an enormous contribution to meeting and being able actually to increase our nationally determined contribution. And for everybody with a concern about climate, it's well recognized that every country's nationally determined contribution, including that from the United States, is far below what it needs to be. And we can, in fact, double and possibly more our nationally determined contributions out of the United States and certainly in some other countries as well. And we can do it through the role of forests. At this point, I would love to open this up for some questions. And uh, these have been being collected uh, by our staff. And I'm looking for a list of some of those questions to come through. If anybody has posed them. And while we're waiting for those to come through, I'm gonna take the liberty of asking our panelists a couple of other questions here that have come up in the course of this. Um, as Andrea mentioned, this conference of the parties has more interest from the private sector than any other COP that I've been involved in. And uh, one person who's involved in the voluntary carbon market space or VCM said, I see a wall of cash coming our way and I hope that people will not just go for the money. And it's really raised this question of what kind of standards should we have? And in addition, what is the role of government in those standards? If this is a market mechanism, shouldn't it be a free market? Shouldn't the market determine those standards? And so while we're waiting for questions to come through, I'm gonna pose that uh, first to Andrew. Well, actually, who on the panel would like to uh, take that question. And I now have a series of uh, other questions that have come in as well. But why don't we start with that one? Uh, and Andrea, do you want to take that? Well, as I tried to express, that really is the nut of what's going on with the Article 6 negotiations. Um, those very questions of how much UN rulemaking should there be, for example, on the um, Article 6. Point, either 2 or 4, the one that deals with country to country trades versus the article that deals with uh, private projects uh, and agreements between private project developers and buyers, such as corporate corporations making net zero pledges. Um, the, there are many uh, uh, entities, mechanisms, uh, for example, the used to be called VCS, now it's called VERA, that are rising to the challenge of setting standards 
for project development uh, so that the corporate pledges really mean something, um, that their, off that their uh, emissions really are being offset by um, real uh, additional uh, permanent uh, types of offsets. And they're gonna be um, highly challenged. Um, uh, part of that is this communication problem and understanding, you know, that ton of CO2 that is emitted to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuel lasts out there for hundreds of years, if not thousands. And therefore the offset needs to be, in order to be real, needs to last a very long time also. That's the point behind California's 100 year standard. Um, so um, there, there isn't, it, this is still an evolving rapidly, uh, rapidly um, developing field. Uh, just today where they came out with three new draft versions of article six, nobody's had a chance to read through them yet, but in the next couple of days, we'll understand what the new version actually says. Those of you who are seriously interested in, in, the, in the wonky part here and the details, uh, you really need to go to the documents. And there's also many, many um, uh, 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 thought um, institutions that are analyzing these. So you can, um, resources for the future, WRI, um, uh, Stavins from Harvard and so on who analyze these so you can get more information there. Laurie, you're on mute. Sorry, folks. Thank you, Anne. Um, we have a series of uh, questions that are coming in around this a twofold focus. If we grow older forests, won't we have a shortage of timber products? And associated with that is if we grow older forests, what happens with fire? So behind that seems to be a question of, if you're growing older forest, does that mean do you stop cutting trees at all? And this question is really more addressed to Jerry from several of the folks uh, who have sent in questions. But the real question is, how do you grow an older forest over time on a landscape? Do you just stop cutting? Well, I don't think you just stop cutting. Uh, what, you, what you do is you, uh, make this uh, transition over a period of time. But let me, at the beginning, just simply note that uh, when you go forest on a very short rotation, you do that because capital markets demand that. The way capital markets work demanded. And in fact, the matter, you aren't even beginning most of the time to realize the real growth potential of that forest. So by growing force on longer cycles between harvests, you're going to actually dramatically increase the amount of wood that's being produced out there and is available either for harvest or for storage of carbon. And so uh, our current strategy is not one that, that maximizes wood production in any way. And so uh, one of the things you do is simply grow the forest longer. Uh, and then when you do harvest it, you don't remove all of it at, at once. You leave parts of it behind to become a part of the next forest generation. Well, and another point there perhaps is that many of our very young forests are very crowded. And in order for those forests to be more natural, to grow older, they need more space. The trees need more space. Sure. So one of the techniques is to do thinning while retaining the majority of the forest. And that thinning material is forest products. And increasingly, many of our forest products are fiber products rather than saw timber. And so they feed that market. And then, as you're saying, there's more volume both for timber and for carbon as the forest gets older. And in fact, it catches up and surpasses itself in about a decade. There's a question to, here that to, I'd like to... To that, to I just would also add that, that wood is uh, a material that is in uh, 
excess supply in the world. So this is not a scarce commodity. Good point. Um, Anne, I'd like to pass a question to you. And that is uh, a question asking about, well, what's the difference between protecting a forest, protectionism, and conserving a forest or conservation? And maybe you could link that to what Jerry Franklin said, all forests work, kind of like all women work, but not all forests get paid, just like all women don't get paid. But what's the difference between protection and conservation? Certainly the, the way we have used protection um, in the past is, is you set aside land and then you pretty much walk away or you do minimal management. You may do wildfire management in, in some areas, but you're um, but you you really leave it as it is to do what it does. And versus it to me in conservation, the way we've approached conservation is actively managing to achieve multiple objectives. Um, it could be the longer rotations, it, it should be water, it should be habitat. And so you're being very deliberate about how you how you manage those lands. To me, the difference is because, and you also have humans on the landscape who have certain expectations. They've moved into some of these, these landscapes. And so they have a very, very direct um, footprint in where we are, are managing those lands. And so to be able to address that, it becomes really critical as part of the whole movement towards conservation. The other thing, and I wanted to, to add this partly to what Jerry just said, but it's something that we forget, especially in our Eastern forests. Our Eastern forests are not the forests of 200 years ago. I mean, they have been hydrated, they have been harvested, they, they have been infected by insects and diseases. We have lost some of the, the true um, mature species, such as chestnut, and white oak and beech in some places and, and um, ash and others. And so we have a really different forest from a species composition, which may in fact not be the optimal forest type for being able to achieve all these goals. And not just about climate response, but also about habitat and water and, and other uses. And so part of the thing that we really should be talking about is um, how do we, what is that future forest like. And you can let a forest just naturally regenerate, but you may in fact need to be um, doing active management. This, to me, this falls under the conservation goal that we want to have a thriving, long, long standing forest. What we have right now as our source material may not get us there. So how do we more deliberately look at what our genetic material is, and being able to be more responsive to that future forest goal than we currently have. Thank you. I'm gonna pose one last question and then we will wrap up. And this goes back to the fire question that was posed. And um, Jerry, I would really appreciate you answering this. And that is really, there's a lot of concern all over the country uh, about fire in our forests. And what's the relationship or is there a relationship between plantation forestry and resilience, resistance to fire, and growing the older forests that you're talking about and their role in fire? <laughs> That's a softball. Uh, <laughs> the reality is that the, the kinds of commercial timber plantations that are, are typically grown on industrial forest lands these days are extremely vulnerable to fire. They have no resistance and very little in the way of resilience. So uh, what we're talking about is growing forests that will be both more resistant to and resilient to a uh, fire. So that's what we're trying to do. And interestingly, by doing that, by growing these forests that have this greater adaptive ability, we're also addressing the, the climate question. We're also doing uh, the, the initial steps that ought to be taken in terms of preparing these forests to deal with the onset of climate change. So uh, growing forests that are older and more natural uh, actually results in less risk to fire and other kinds of 
catastrophes. Well, I think that is a great note to close this webinar on because what Jerry has just said is we have an incredible ability to manage our forests for climate and we'll get other benefits that Anne was mentioning of watershed and risk reduction from fire and doing that with respect to keeping communities involved and the labor force that we need involved in our forests is also part of that. I thank you all for joining us and um, please join us again in March when we will have our next webinar on seeing the forests. So seeing the forests for the trees, we need to see them for the climate, for the water, for the wildlife and for our future. Thank you very much.